Good morning. If you're watching this video today, perhaps you uh, read my article in the American Fruit Grower magazine, uh, the March 2011 edition called, Are You Stressed? Uh, which was dealing with stress in peach orchards. And um, today, I'm gonna be speaking about recognizing stress factors in orchards with a particular emphasis on peach. It's possible that one day you're driving through your orchard and uh, you see lots of healthy trees and you come across one that looks like this in the foreground and you say, uh-oh, what is wrong? Uh, this tree is dropping its leaves. It has, it has a serious issue and uh, you're interested in figuring out what caused this problem. Perhaps you drive a little further down in the orchard and you come across a tree like this and it's, oh no, I'm too late. Um, this tree is dead. Well, today in this presentation, I'll be making reference to several different types of stress and then how these can be managed and, and how you can make good decisions as it relates to managing stress in a commercial orchard. Stress includes numerous factors that adversely impact plant health, plant growth, productivity, and survival. These can be biotic or living factors, or these can be abiotic or non-living factors. And often multiple factors occur simultaneously, that is at the same time, or successively, that is one after another. Today I'm gonna to speak about biotic stresses and abiotic stresses. And in particular for the biotic stresses, I'll speak briefly about insects, fungal diseases, bacterial diseases, viruses and viroids, mycoplasmas, nematodes, we'll speak about wildlife browsing, and weeds. And then in terms of the abiotic stresses, we'll speak about solar radiation, air and soil temperature, rainfall, soil nutrition, soil structure and aeration, wind, air pollution, and hail. And I'll make a few comments about an, uh, a few other abiotic stresses at the end. So first, it's important to understand the tree as a living organism that requires energy for growth and development. And this occurs through photosynthesis, where sun energy and carbon dioxide is car combined with water for the production of carbohydrates. And you have root, the root system of the tree is taking up water and nutrients, and the leaves are the photosynthetic machinery of the tree. They're producing energy and carbohydrates that are utilized by the tree for growth and maintenance. And as you can see in this diagram, there's fruit growth and maintenance, there's shoot growth and maintenance, there is leaf growth and maintenance, then there is trunk and conductive tissue growth and maintenance, and there's root growth and maintenance. So all these different areas of the tree require energy and carbohydrates for growth. And factors that adversely impact the ability of the tree to photosynthesize can compromise these, the, these growth uh, factors that are necessary to be healthy and productive. So think about the tree as a machine that requires energy for growth and development, and stress adversely impacts the ability to produce energy that is necessary. Now, much stress can be avoided if first a good site is selected. This is absolutely critical. A site where the soil is well-drained, where the air is well-drained, um, where it's not going to be susceptible to frost and other problems. This is very important. It's also important to pre-plant fumigate to uh, reduce any populations of hazardous or harmful nematodes like the ring nematode uh, that we have a problem with in the southeastern United States. It's also important to choose the proper rootstock. Uh, there are rootstocks that can be chosen for peaches that are adapted to different types of soil conditions or nematode problems. And in the southeast, we typically recommend using the guardian rootstock because it is tolerant to the ring nematode. It's also vigorous and will help to establish a good tree early. It's also important to choose the proper cultivar in terms of the chill hour requirement and in terms of susceptibility to various diseases. So 
knowing what the chill our typical chill our rating would be for your zone and then choosing call the bars that are within that chill our typical chill our rating would be absolutely critical for example on the south of South Carolina along the coast where we typically get four maybe six hundred chill hours it would not be wise to choose cultivars that require a thousand chill hours because they would rarely crop there on the other hand in the upstate of South Carolina where we'll typically get a thousand chill hours it wouldn't be wise to plant a cultivar that has only 400 chill hour requirement because it would probably bloom early in the spring and never never crop because the flowers would be killed by early spring freeze the proper planting depth is very important and I have some uh, photographs that will show this clearly uh, as we get later into the talk and it's important to make proper prun pruning cuts so that wounds can heal uh, when cuts are not made properly and wounds do not heal properly uh, they can provide places where uh, wood boring insects and disease can get in to cause significant stress to the tree it's also important to carefully use machinery if you're mowing uh, not to tear up the bark of the tree by having the mower bang into the tree as you're going through the orchard uh, those types of wounds are difficult difficult to heal <clears throat> and can prevent or present sites where uh, wood boring insects can get in also it's important to develop the structure of the tree so that the scaffold branches are strong so that they're not um, easily broken when they're laden down with a large crop of fruit and then maintaining proper fertility for the tree uh, and managing pests is vital as well as uh, supplying supplemental irrigation in times of drought and managing weeds because weeds are a very strong competitor for water and nutrients so let's talk about stress factors a little bit further it's important to realize that stress may be localized or it can be widespread when I say localized I mean on an individual limb or a single tree in comparison with widespread which could be an uh, entire block of trees it could be several hundred trees depending on the circumstances and oftentimes one stress can exacerbate another so for example if you had a hailstorm which caused many wounds to the the uh, bark of the tree to the branches of the tree this would provide sites for borers to get in and um, to cause damage it's also important to realize uh, the timing of stress when does the stress occur relative to key phenological stages for example a drought that occurs uh, during the stage two or the pit hardening phase is not nearly as critical as a drought that occurs during stage three of fruit growth or the final swell phase the last two weeks before harvest certainly drought that occurs then could adversely impact fruit size and that would be problematic for your marketing some stresses are reversible while others are irreversible an example of a reversible stress is trees that are looking a little bit nitrogen starved after harvest uh, the leaf color is becoming a little bit yellow and it's obvious that the trees need nitrogen uh, a post-harvest application of calcium nitrate which can be readily taken up by the tree could relieve that stress quite quickly and provide sufficient nitrogen to serve as reserves in the tree to help to have a strong bud crop the following spring so that's reversible an irreversible stress would for example be 48 hours of, of saturated soil conditions or flooding in a peach orchard uh, that's enough to actually kill peach trees and um, so that is irreversible and finally I wanted to talk for a moment just about short versus long-term impact of stress it's possible you could go out into the orchard on a very hot dry sunny day and the tree is laden with fruit and the leaves are wilting because of the the stress of the heat and the inadequate supply of water um, that's a short-term stress and if the next day tends to be a little bit cooler and there's rainfall uh, that stress can be ameliorated uh, overnight however if the tree has a systemic virus uh, that would be a long-term stress in fact the virus will remain in the tree throughout its entire life and that can compromise its growth and its productivity so there can be short and long-term impacts of stress 
We're going to speak about biotic stresses and abiotic stresses in this presentation. And the biotic or living stresses um, include insects, fungal diseases, bacterial diseases, viruses and viroids, mycoplasmas, nematodes, wildlife browsing, and weeds. The abiotic or non-living stresses include solar radiation, air and soil temperature, rainfall, soil nutrition, soil structure and aeration, wind, air pollution, and hail. And at the end of the presentation, I'll speak about a few other abiotic stresses that are also of interest. So first we'll talk about a few insect species that are relevant in terms of stress. The first is the lesser peach tree borer. The lesser peach tree borer is a clear wing moth. It flies during the summertime and the female will find wounds on the tree and look for those wounds and that's where she will lay her eggs. So in the top left photograph you have the female and uh, on the top right photograph, there's a wound on a scaffold branch. And that's a perfect place for her to come and lay eggs. Uh, the bottom right hand corner shows the caterpillar and the pupil case of a lesser peach tree borer in a, in a wound um, that was created by a poor pruning cut. And you can see damage that has occurred there. And in the bottom left photograph is a scaffold branch that has died because it has been effectively girdled by the lesser peach tree borer. So if this pest isn't managed, and if, if the grower does not take uh, effort to minimize uh, damaging cuts and wounds on the tree, entire scaffolds can be lost, which can dramatically reduce the productive uh, fruiting area on the tree and, and compromise yield significantly. Another insect that's of, of interest is the white peach scale. And it's difficult to see the white peach scale because it's small. And uh, oftentimes growers won't notice it until an entire scaffold is gone, like on the, the photograph on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, we typically manage a white peach scale with two dormant oil applications in the winter. The oil will suffocate the scale and prevent respiration, and it will die. But uh, scale does need to be managed. It can significantly weaken the tree. Um, a more rare uh, insect damage that we see in, in stressed orchards is the engraver beetle. On the left half of the screen you have a tree trunk with uh, little tubes of sawdust coming out from the trunk of the tree and those are uh, associated with the entry hole of the engraver beetle that has bored, bored through the bark and is into the wood and each of these holes pro provides a place for entry of, of other pathogens and it significantly can stress the tree. Next, I'd like to speak about a couple of relevant fungal diseases as it relates to stress. First, I'd like to speak about our malaria root rot. In this photograph, we're in a mature peach orchard and the, the left tree um, near the two gentlemen in the photograph is a healthy peach tree. The one in the middle uh, is a dying peach tree and then the one on the right that doesn't have any leaves on it, this one is dead. And the dying and dead trees are infected with our malaria root rot, which is a soil-borne pathogen I can actually live in the soil for up to 100 years on dead root pieces underneath the bark. And uh, it is a significant problem in the southeastern United States. And it really can't be removed from the soil. So uh, the best case scenario is to find sites where our malaria is not present. Now, if you were to go into an orchard, what you might see as symptoms in the top left-hand photograph are trees that are leafing out, but they look like they're drought stressed. Uh, this is symptomatic of an armillary root rot infection. Uh, later in the season, down at the trunk of the tree on the bottom left photograph, you can see withered mushrooms. Now normally they look uh, a lot nicer than this, but this is after they've begun to die. And the mushrooms are produced at the crown of the tree because the fungus has worked its way up to the crown, it has girdled the crown, and then the, fu the, the fungus is producing these fruiting bodies at the ground level. Um, that would indicate the tree is probably going to die very soon. The top right photograph is um, when you cut back the bark at the ground level, that is at the crown, um, you can see underneath the bark the, the white mycelial fans that are associated with this fungus. And if you were to cut the bark off and put this up to your nose, it would smell like a mushroom. That's very diagnostic of our malaria. And the bottom right photograph shows a series of trees adjacent to each other in a high-density orchard where there was root grafting 
and where the armillaria root rot fungus spread from tree to tree in a high density planting and we have many many trees that died there now brown rot or monolinia fungus is also a problem and creates stress in peach orchards certainly it causes problems in terms of loss of fruit but also we have problems in that when the blossom is infected we can have a blossom blight which is a canker and in the top left photograph you can see a node where there was a blossom and uh, there's an infection there there's a canker the bottom left photograph you can see uh, fruit that are infected with brown rot fungus in the top right photograph you have a mummy that is a mummified fruit it was infected with brown rot and that will be a source of fungal inoculum for spring infections the subsequent year if it's not removed the bottom right photograph shows uh, wound gumming that's associated with one of these cankers uh, on a shoot in the tree and so that will cause that shoot effectively to die and it will not be productive so we need to manage this disease as well Phomopsis or constriction canker is another fungus that can cause the loss of fruiting shoots and in the top left photograph uh, the vertical portion of the shoot you can see it has brown tissue uh, that's the constricted area where the infection has occurred below that you have a shoot going off to the right uh, that's healthy and green um, where the constriction occurred all the tissue beyond that constriction point will die so that's evident in the bottom left photograph the top right photograph and the bottom right photograph. You can see shoots with brown leaves. Uh, the leaves are brown. The shoots were constricted because of the canker. And that's fruiting wood that is lost. That's productive area of the tree that will no longer bear peaches. Uh, that disease also needs to be managed. Fungal gamosis is something that can also be observed in orchards. Um, when you see large amounts of gumming coming from lenticels in the bark of the tree that would be an indication that the tree has a fungal gamosis infection and certainly removing uh, inoculum from the orchard is very important and there are other management practices to try and reduce fungal gamosis but it's an indicator that there's stress in the orchard uh, caused by this fungus and the energy that's required to produce the wound gumming is energy that's being used that could be used for developing fruit so it is something that also requires management Next, I'll speak about bacterial diseases. Um, on the left half of this photograph, we have two pictures uh, of bacterial spot disease. And bacterial spot uh, causes damage not only to the leaves, but it also causes damage to fruit, and it can compromise productivity and health of the tree. In the middle portion of the photograph, on the top and in the bottom, we have photographs of bacterial canker. This can cause significant damage to scaffold branches and uh, fruiting wood of the tree and it can adversely compromise tree health and then in the top right photograph we have um, uh, crown gall which is a bacterial disease in the soil and um, nurserymen deal with this disease if they found if they find trees with crown gall in the nursery those need to be destroyed um, so these are some bacterial diseases that can be a problem and cause stress to the tree now phony peach um, is an example here in this photograph the tree in the middle which is stunted is a tree that is infected with a bacterial disease um, xylella fastidiosa and it causes stunting of the tree the two trees on either side of the tree with phony are healthy they're all the same age and uh, what we do to manage phony disease is we actually rogue the tree it's, it's removed and destroyed now there are also viruses and viroids that present stress to the tree and uh, in this photograph the top left you can see fruit um, that have symptoms of plum pox virus and uh, if plum pox virus is found in the orchard obviously the trees need to be destroyed uh, this is a quarantine pest in the United States and uh, the United States Department of Agriculture will come and through through their APHIS branch they will um, establish a quarantine area and trees will need to be removed and destroyed. In the bottom left photograph and the center bottom photograph, we have symptoms of uh, pruned dwarf virus, and then we have peach latent mosaic, peach latent mosaic viroid, which is a, 
a viroid, which can also cause problems and uh, be in the life in the tree for its entire life. And uh, these are these are diseases or viruses that need to be uh, watched out for. And uh, when symptoms are observed, uh, bring that to the attention of your extension agent so the trees can be properly taken care of. Mycoplasmas are also a biotic stress factor in peach orchards. Um, most common would be stone fruit yellows, uh, which is something that's typically observed in the orchards in Europe. We don't see that much here in the United States, but in this photograph on the left, left side, you see uh, shoots of a tree with stone fruit yellows. And on the right half of the photograph, you see shoots of a tree that are healthy. Um, and this is what these symptoms look like. There's also a mycoplasma called X disease, which is sometimes observed in the northern states of the United States, which can also cause problems. Uh, it affects the foliage and the development of fruit, and uh, this is a problematic disease, and it's called a mycoplasma. Now, in terms of nematodes, uh, we're primarily concerned about the ring nematode, in, at least in the southeastern United States. Other places are concerned with root knot nematode and other species. But the nematodes feed on the root system. They cause galls. The tree needs to use energy to uh, deal with this problem that compromises their growth. And, and the trees can actually die because of high nematode populations. In the bottom photograph, you can see one tree that looks excellent where the yellow arrow is. And that's a tree on the guardian rootstock on a site that has a high population of ring nematode. The trees that are in front of that tree that are dead are susceptible trees. They are on rootstocks that are susceptible to the ring nematode. So you can see the benefit in this photograph of having a tree with a resistant rootstock uh, in a place where there's a high population of ring nematode. Next, I'll speak about wildlife. And certainly uh, deer are very happy to browse on young peach trees and they can significantly uh, reduce um, the number of shoots on the tree. They can cause considerable damage and uh, wildlife can be managed either by hunting or they can be managed, uh, at least in terms of young trees, by using uh, very fragrant uh, bars of soap that will help to um, keep the deer out of the orchard. But in some cases, the pressure of the deer population may be so high that uh, even the soap doesn't work. Um, so in that case, uh, perhaps a deer fence, a tall deer fence or a, a slanted deer fence may be useful to help keep deer out. And then I want to speak about weeds uh, for a moment. Um, weed control is very important. Whether you're mowing or you're using herbicides uh, to limit the population of weeds, uh, at least from the tree row, so that the trees can get an adequate supply of water and nutrition and not be competing with weeds for that. Um, often, um, broadleaf weeds will also encourage particular species of insects like stink bugs to, to be attracted to them, mm -hmm. and they will often move from the weeds up into the tree as the weeds begin to die. And they can feed on and cause considerable damage to the fruit, uh, which can compromise your ability to have high quality fruit to sell, uh, which reduces your uh, profit. Next, I'd like to speak about solar radiation. And often, we don't see symptoms like this. But this past summer in South Carolina, for example, we had some very hot, uh, very sunny days uh, as fruit were maturing on the tree. And we actually had symptoms of sunburn. Um, and it wasn't that the trees didn't have adequate foliage. Uh, it was just really hot, really sunny days, persisting for a long period of time. And uh, the, fruit of the surface of the fruit simply got too hot and it caused damage, as you can see in this photograph. We also have concerns about air and soil temperature. And uh, most of the time, what we're concerned about is temperature that's cold. Uh, on the top left photograph, uh, this is a peach tree that was growing in my yard in Seneca, South Carolina. And we had snowfall, actually, while the tree was during bloom. And most of those flowers froze, and they did not produce fruit. However, oftentimes in the spring, when we have uh, cold weather symptoms, uh, or, or conditions, I should say, um, we can have fruit like in the bottom left photograph where uh, the fruit were damaged as they were growing, but they didn't actually fall off the tree. Uh, if you look at the top right photograph, there's an example of some fruit 
where there was damage during the during the cold temperatures which caused the skin to crack providing sources of sites where brown rock fungi can get in and grow like the photograph where that brown fruit is adjacent to them and then in the bottom right photograph we also have fruit of different sizes because different degrees of damage occurred perhaps to the seed while those fruit were on the tree and the small fruit that never sized may have had a damaged seed that couldn't adequately support fruit growth whereas the the large fruit that are there the seed was not damaged so cold injury obviously it can kill flowers which means the fruit will not develop at all or it can occur when the fruit are small and damage the seed some fruit may felt may fall off the tree if the seed is completely killed or if it's just partially damaged they may grow but not grow completely or they may be compromised with cracking and other problems so cold is a is a serious problem and for us especially in the southeast now another thing that can be observed if there's very high temperatures during the flower bud initiation stage in the summer we can actually have the production of multiple ovaries per flower uh, this is a high temperature phenomenon it occurs in the summer and if you look at this photograph in the top left uh, you can see a single fruit that's developing from a flower in the bottom left you can see what we would call a twin these are uh, double ovaries or two pistils that were both pollinated and then in the top right we have a triple where the because of the high temperatures there were uh, three pistils that were produced that when they were pollinated resulted in a triple fruit uh, this is a function of high temperature uh, the doubles and the triples uh, those would need to be thinned off that's wasted fruiting area or wasted fruit um, so this is a symptom that can be observed sometimes it's typically not seen very often but it's obviously associated with very high temperatures during flower bud initiation in the summer and it will impact the fruit that develop the following year now when temperatures are very hot uh, oftentimes we can see premature leaf drop so in the left photograph where I have the label drought on the ground below the tree you can see a lot of yellow and those are leaves that fell off the tree in response to high temperature and inadequate water there wasn't enough rain and then also sometimes under very high temperature conditions uh, we can have premature fruit drop as you can see in the photograph on the right where fruit simply drop off the tree early I'll speak for a moment now about rainfall and when there is too much rain what can happen is as the water fills the soil the water pushes out the oxygen and you have only really diffused oxygen in the water and there's not enough oxygen to support uh, respiration of the roots and the roots can actually die so the air spaces in the soil are filled with water and there's inadequate oxygen for, to support root growth. And this is a problem if there is inadequate drainage and there's too much rainfall in a short period of time. Uh, a top left photograph here is a peach orchard in South Carolina where there were torrential rains and uh, there was an inability to get water off the field. And um, at the bottom left photograph, although the grower was trying to pump the water out, um, the water was not completely pumped out of the field until uh, more than 48 hours later and many of the trees in this location die and when you excavate around the root system and the crown of the tree you'll see brown tissue under the bark uh, it's dead uh, it could be simply from water or it could be a function of infection with phytophthora which is often associated with uh, wet soils and poor soil drainage rarely uh, we see this in the southeast but there are times when we have tremendous rainfall it's not enough rainfall uh, to actually cause death of the root system and killing the tree but we'll see fruit split because of too much rain in a very short period of time and these are what uh, those symptoms would look like also uh, when there is inadequate water and high temperatures as i've mentioned already uh, we can have leaves drop and fruit can drop it can be a combination of drought or high heat conditions or both to cause these symptoms. I'd like to speak for a moment about soil nutrition. And it's important to ensure that the elements that are necessary for tree growth are supplied through annual fertilization, uh, soil testing, and foliar nutrient testing can be used 
to determine what's available in the soil and what's present in the tree and fertilizer recommendations can be made based on that information but the symptoms for nitrogen deficiency are evident in the top left photograph and you can see the starting to the reddening color of the leaves if it's an iron deficiency in the bottom left photograph these would be symptoms typical for that in the in the foliage top right would be a potassium deficiency with the leaf curling and then in the bottom right would be a zinc deficiency it's also possible to have too much fertilizer which can cause excessive growth and this is also undesirable so making sure to have a right balance of nutrients available at the time of the year when the tree can take it up by the roots and utilize it for growth and development is very important now we're also interested in soil structure and aeration because this can present problems in terms of tree stress if a tree is planted too deep on a heavy soil that can cause it to die prematurely this would be a typical symptom that I've seen uh, at some orchards before in the top left photograph we have a tree that's planted on heavy soils and it's been planted too deep the bottom left photograph um, there's a yellow arrow up at the top and then there's a yellow arrow at the bottom these arrows correspond to where the soil line was at the top and where the tree should have been planted at the bottom so it was planted about eight inches too deep the top right photograph we pulled that tree out of the ground and we laid it on its side and you can see notches on the trunk of the tree and on the right hand side that notch is where the tree should have been planted the middle notch is where the graft union is and the left notch is where the soil line was when the tree was planted about eight inches too deep we want to have that graft union about four inches above the ground when the tree has been planted and it has settled uh, in the soil the bottom right photograph just shows the dead bark or the dead tissue underneath the bark that's either a function of uh, too much water which caused the tree to die or it could be a, a phytophthora infection um, could also be the cause here so planting too deep on heavy soils obviously is problematic now you can also have stress associated with wind and if a windstorm comes through an orchard or even a tornado perhaps uh, a large amount of the leaf area can be damaged and lost and that compromises the ability of the tree to produce energy through photosynthesis. Uh, in the top, in the right-hand side of the photograph, you can see scaffold branches that were twisted and broken. So a large portion of this tree is going to be lost because of this damage from wind. Air pollution is also uh, something that can cause stress to the tree. We don't see it often, but I wanted to show some photographs of symptoms. Uh, to get an idea of what air pollution would look like if it was present on the left hand side of the photograph we have peach trees or peach leaves excuse me that have been damaged by ozone those two on the right and then on the right hand side of the photograph th these are symptoms associated with sulfur dioxide which can also be an air pollutant and then these photographs uh, represent hydrogen fluoride damage uh, on the top right this is necrosis on the bottom left these would be the chlorotic symptoms and then on the bottom right we have what would be a soft suture symptom associated with hydrogen fluoride damage not seen very often but it can be seen uh, sometimes I'd like to speak for a moment about hail I've, I've spoken uh, considerably about hail already but if you have a hailstorm coming uh, you can see in the bottom left the hailstones can range in size sometimes they can be as large as a baseball and when a living tree is hit by these as they're falling from the sky it can cause tremendous damage to the bark it can tear off leaves it can damage fruit and um, these wounds if they are not uh, protected in some way by insecticide and fungicide uh, they can provide a great source of entry for disease for uh, lesser peach tree borer and uh, the trees can be devastated because of that so uh, coming in to manage after a hailstorm is very important. You don't want to neglect this orchard and abandon it. Uh, otherwise, the, ne the following year it may be so compromised that it will never come back adequately to be productive. And uh, I'd like to mention a few other stress factors as we close out the presentation today. The first is fire. 
second is erosion third is herbicide drift and then i'll speak for a moment about inadequate chilling and over cropping the top left photograph is of an orchard in south carolina where the uh, the ground cover was not managed properly and there was dry vegetation throughout the orchard and um, a neighbor was burning leaves and some sparks from those leaves that were burning came over onto this orchard floor and it was a windy day and that ground cover caught fire and the next thing you know you've got about 300 peach trees that are burned up by fire uh, peach trees and fire do not go well together they will not survive fire so obviously good orchard floor management is important to reduce uh, the potential fuel for a fire whether it's uh, neighbors burning leaves or it's a lightning strike or somebody throws a cigarette out the window um, you don't want to have fire in an orchard the bottom left photograph shows uh, erosion problem where um, an aggressive herbicide program to keep the weeds down followed by uh, very strong torrential rains uh, cause water to to wash and to uh, tremend create tremendous erosion where trees actually toppled over because the soil was washed out from under them now in the top right, you can see symptoms of herbicide damage. Uh, I believe this is simazine. And in the bottom right, you can see symptoms of peach trees that were sprayed accidentally by Roundup. A uh, careful use of herbicides is very important because herbicides are designed to kill plants. And certainly peach trees can be killed by herbicides if they're not used properly. And uh, minimizing drift and using a shielded sprayer and following all recommendations is important so that you don't uh, adversely impact your healthy trees uh, by missing your target, which would be weeds. Occasionally, in different parts of the southeastern United States, we'll have years where we have a warm winter and we get inadequate chilling. And if higher chill cultivars are being grown in areas where uh, a low chill winter occurs, um, they may not adequately leaf out in the springtime. And in the photograph here, you can see that there are flowers on the tree, but the trees are not developing a good leaf crop, and that's primarily due to inadequate chilling that occurred the previous winter. And so obviously these trees would be stressed under these circumstances. And overcropping can also be a problem. It's a problem in the sense that if the, if the, if the geometry of the branches is such that the crotch angles are narrow and you have heavy weights of fruit uh, on those narrow crotch angles, when the weight of those fruit uh, come down during that final swell phase, you can have scaffold branches or uh, large limbs that can actually break off the tree um, because of the heavy weight of the fruit. And this shouldn't happen. Um, as you're developing the scaffold of the tree throughout your pruning and training uh, in its young life, and then as you're thinning the tree during uh, the springtime after the crop is set, um, you should be able to manage the crop load in such a way that you don't have too much fruit on the tree that limbs are going to break. But obviously when they do, uh, that can significantly reduce your productive area of the tree. And if we look at the bottom left of the tree, that would be a perpendicular high density tree where both scaffolds broke down because there was too much fruit. Uh, that tree is a complete loss. Finally, um, it's important to minimize the potential for risk in the first place. This is just a wise practice for any orchard manager. And to try and manage factors that you have control over. To recognize the sources, whether they're biotic or abiotic or both. And then to deal with controllable factors and consider the long-term implications of the stress. Is it something that can be managed or is the tree so compromised that it will never be productive again and should it simply be removed? And then deal with uncontrollable factors wisely. For example, if a block has been compromised and only modest control options are necessary to bring it back into strong uh, health, then those, should be, those practices should be undertaken. Um, if, however, the orchard is completely devastated and there's really no hope, then certainly take it out and plan on replanting. And one thing I always advise growers to do is to keep good records from year to year by block. So if you have a stressful circumstance in an orchard this year, record that, 
put down what your preventive measures were, and then make observations the next year and see if you were able to improve tree health, how they responded. Keeping good records year to year by block is an excellent practice for any orchard manager. And finally, learn from mistakes and try not to repeat them. I mean, that's something we have to deal with as scientists. You have to deal with it as growers. But by recording things, by making good observations, if you need your county extension agent to come to your farm and help you diagnose what the problem is, or a specialist, availing yourselves of people who have those kinds of skills can help you to learn and then not repeat mistakes and hopefully be as profitable as possible. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge several individuals and sources that I used for photographs in this presentation. Uh, without them, it would not be possible to present this information to you, and I give them credit here. And uh, with thanks uh, for your attention, if you'd like to communicate with me, you can reach me at this contact information here at Clemson University. And uh, thank you for watching this presentation today.